Hi everyone! So in today's video we are going to be continuing to talk about inverse trigonometric functions. Um, specifically there's one thing that I didn't really mention last time that I just want to um, bring up and then we're going to get into composing trigonometric functions and inverse trigonometric functions together which sounds complicated but it's actually I think easier than it looks. Um, so we're still in section 5.5 in the book still talking about inverse trigonometric functions. So the thing I just wanted to bring up um, is related to the domain of inverse trigonometric functions. So I just wanted to, um, to just write this down because it's, it's something we talked about with sine and cosine, but I kind of forgot to bring it up with tangent and it actually is pretty different with tangent. So, um, so domains of My pen has been like a little unpredictable, so I'm hoping it keeps working. Um, domains of inverse trig functions. So remember that when you have a, um, a function and it's inverse, their domain and their range are gonna switch. So in order to understand what the domain of an inverse trig function is, so remember domain means the types of numbers that you're allowed to plug into that function. So in order to understand the domain of an inverse trig function, you want to look at what is the range of its, you know, the original trig function that corresponds. So remember that um, a function and its inverse have um, basically, I'll just say it like this, I'll say swapped domains and ranges. What I mean by that is that the domain of one is the range of the other and the range of one is the domain of the other. So let's say for example that we wanted to look at um, inverse sine. So I'm just gonna start by writing down f of x is equal to sine of x. So if we were interested in what is the domain of inverse sine, we would want to know what is the range of the original sine, right? Because that's the, the inverse function. So the range of the sine function, if you think about it, is negative one to one. And we'll, I'll pull up the graph in a second so to give you kind of another way of seeing that. But why is the range negative one to one? Because we've talked about this in the last few videos. Anytime you take sine of an angle, you're never ever going to get a number that is bigger than one or smaller than negative one because of the definition we're using on the unit circle, it's just not possible for you to have a point on the unit circle where the y coordinate is bigger than one or smaller than negative one. So what does that tell us? That tells us that for inverse sine, the domain is going to be negative one to one. And I'll do an example in a little bit where we'll see like where this comes up, but basically it's this idea that you cannot take inverse sine of like 1.1. It just doesn't make sense. And so it's the same thing for, um, for cosine. So I'll just write that one down as well because cosine has the same um, range So that means that inverse cosine also has a domain of negative one to one. So this is where like on the, um, the worksheet and the other videos and on the homework, there's been a few examples where the answer is does not exist because you, could, because you cannot take inverse cosine or inverse sine of a number that is not between negative one and one. So how can we see this kind of visually well, if you look at the graphs of sine of x and cosine of x, so here's the graph of sine of x, here's the graph of cosine of x, they're always between negative one and one, right? Like no matter where you go on the graph, the graph is always stuck between heights of negative one and one. And just to remind you, when we're talking about inverse functions, we're actually looking at like a restricted version of the function. So um, here, oops, here is like just sine of x, and then this would be the 
um, restricted version that we use for finding the inverse. But it doesn't really matter because either way, the range is the same, right? If, regardless of whether you have the whole graph or just this little snippet of the graph, you still have a range of negative one to one. And then same thing with cosine. So here's the full graph of cosine. Here is now the restricted version that we use for finding the inverse function. But again, it doesn't matter. The range is still negative one to one. So what is different about tangent? Well, if you look at the graph of tangent, so I'm just gonna pull up the graph of tangent of x, the range of tangent is actually all real numbers. It's not stuck between negative one and one the way that sine and cosine are. And the reason for that is because tangent is not like just a point on the unit circle. Tangent is that slope. It's a ratio of two numbers. And if you're on the unit circle, you can get a slope as steep or as negative steep as you want. And so that means that you can get results for tangent that are really, really big or really, really small. So tangent has a range of all real numbers. And again, even if we do the restricted version that we do for the, um, the inverse, so here's the restricted version of tangent, it still has a range of all real numbers. And so what that's gonna tell us is that, so if you're working with h of x is equal to tangent of x, the range is all real numbers, so negative infinity to positive infinity. And so that tells us that if you're working with inverse tangent, the range is going to be, or sorry, the domain is going to be all real numbers. So how does this kind of play out? Well, for example, if you were asked to find, um, let's say inverse sine of 2.5, that does not exist because it's not in the domain, right? Like when we when you talk about the domain of a function, the domain means what are the numbers that you're allowed to plug in? And so if you know 2.5 is not in the domain, that tells us that the answer doesn't exist, we can't plug it in. Similarly, if you tried to take um, inverse cosine of let's say negative six over five. So that's like negative, I think negative 1.2. So it's, it's smaller than negative one. That also does not exist because it's not in the domain. It's not negative six over five is not one of the numbers that you're allowed to plug into inverse cosine. On the other hand, for tangent, you can take inverse tangent of actually any number you want. So for example, I could do inverse tangent of 2.5. And so that would be one that you would need to do in a calculator. So if you remember in yesterday's video, we did some of the examples of um, inverse tangent where you could do it without a calculator. So things like root three or one or zero, and I'll, I'll pull up an example like that in a second, but, um, but some of them you have to type into a calculator. And so according to my calculator, this is about, um, and I, I might be going off screen here, so let me scroll over. Um, this is about 1.19 radians. Or you could do inverse tangent of negative six over five. So that was the one that I, you know, doesn't work for cosine or inverse cosine, but it does work for inverse tangent. So if you do inverse tangent of negative six over five, according to my calculator, that is negative um, 0.88 radians. Um, we also talked, so in yesterday's video, we did an example where we found inverse tangent of negative square root of three. So that one you can do without a calculator. I'm not gonna go through that because we literally did that exact example in yesterday's video. Um, but we basically just use the unit circle. And we got, in that case, negative pi over three radians. So square root of three is or negative square root of three is less than negative one, right? If you type, I mean, actually, let me type it into my calculator now because I don't know off the top of my head, but um, square root of three is about 1.73. So this number that we're plugging into inverse tangent is less than negative one, but that's fine. There's no issue with plugging numbers into to tam inverse tangent. You could even take inverse tangent of something like really big, like let's say 100. So inverse tangent of 100 Let's think for a second actually before we even type this into a calculator about what we would expect that to be. 
So remember, tangent tells you, you, know, you can think of it as being sine over cosine or y over x, but I think in a lot of cases, the, the best kind of intuitive way of thinking about it is it's the slope of the line that you draw in the unit circle corresponding to an angle. So for example, if you have an angle of pi over four, that slope is one, right? Or if you have an angle of zero, that slope is zero. Um, if you have a slope of 100, what's that gonna look like? That's gonna be like extremely steep. Like it would probably, we probably would not be able to even differentiate it from vertical. So a slope of 100 would be like, you go up 100 boxes over one box. That's a very, very steep line. And so that means that our answer should be very close to pi over two. It's not gonna be equal to pi over two because tangent of pi over two is undefined. That would be an undefined slope if it's a vertical line, but it's very close to vertical. And so we should expect our answer to be very close to pi over two. And so I typed this into my calculator and I got 1.56 radians. And just to give you an idea, and we talked about this yesterday, um, pi over two, is about 1.57 radians. So we're really, really close to uh, an angle of pi over two. So I bring this up just because, you know, even when you're using your calculator, like I said in the last video, you can still kind of connect it to the angles that you do know on the unit circle. And, and I, I think that's a really good thing to do so that you don't, you're not just sort of typing stuff into a calculator without any idea of like what you're actually looking at. Okay, so. What we're gonna spend the rest of this video on is um, doing something where we're gonna be basically composing um, trigonometric functions and inverse trigonometric functions. And so we learned about composing functions in 141, and this is, is technically the same idea, but we're not gonna be like using really like the notation of composing functions so much, but I'm still gonna call it, uh, call it that. So, so an example of what that might look like um, and then we'll, we'll actually compute these examples a little bit later, would be something like inverse sine of sine of five pi over six. So we're calling it composing because you're kind of taking one and plugging it into the other, and that's what composing functions mean. So we're not using that, you know, F compose with G symbol, but we really are composing because we're taking one thing and plugging it into the other one. Um, another example could be something where the regular sign is on the outside. So sine of inverse sine of negative one half would be another example. So we'll get into to how to actually do these in, in a moment. Um, but one thing I just want to say that's really important here is that you should not assume that the like inverse and non-inverse functions cancel each other out. So for example, this one up here, we'll do this in a minute. This will actually be the first example we do. This is not gonna be equal to five pi over six. You might like look at that and say, oh, inverse, regular sign, they just cancel each other out. It doesn't work that way. So in some cases it will, but you should never assume that they're gonna cancel each other out. Um, and there's some rules that you can learn about like when they do and when they don't, but I personally think that the easiest way to do this is just to kind of take them case by case and you're basically gonna kind of go work on the inside and work your way out. So let me just write that down. Do not assume that, um, I'll, I don't like saying regular, let's just say trig and inverse trig always cancel each other. Instead, start by evaluating the inner expression. So again, we'll do an example in a second, but when I say inner, I mean, for example, um, on this top one, we're gonna start by figuring out what is sine of five pi over six. And then once we have that, then we can do inverse sine of whatever that answer is. So we're gonna start by evaluating the inner expression and then we're going to move outward. So it's, it's basically order of operations, right? Like order of operations, um, just to give it like a totally unrelated question, if you were asked to find like one plus two squared, 
you would first add together one plus two, right? And say, okay, that's three, and then you would square it. And so it's the same idea. We're gonna do the stuff on the inside of the parentheses first, and then we're gonna do the stuff on the outside. Okay, so let's jump into some examples. And basically the rest of this video is just gonna be examples. Um, I'm picking examples that bring up all sorts of different things. So, you know, it's, it might feel repetitive, but there's gonna be, each example is gonna kind of bring something slightly different to the table. Um, okay, so let's say that we wanted to find inverse sine of sine of five pi over six. So again, let's start with this inside part. So we're gonna focus on first finding sine of five pi over six. So let me just grab, I have a whole bunch of unit circles on this page because I know we're gonna need a lot of them. So how do you find sine of five pi over six? Well, you go to an angle of five pi over six, so that's gonna be basically 30 degrees away from horizontal. Because six pi over six would be pi, so this is five pi over six, it's pi over six less than pi. And so the coordinates of this point are gonna be negative square root of three over two and positive one half. And so what is sine of, um, of five pi over six? It's the y coordinate, so it's gonna be one half. So now that we've evaluated what is sine of five pi over six, all we have to do is go and put that into our inverse sine. So instead of writing um, sine of five pi over six, we can just put one half, right? Because that's what sine of five pi over six is. And at this point, you want to literally forget about five pi over six. You can just pretend, like just forget that this part of the problem even happened. All you wanna focus on now is finding inverse sine of one half. So it's like a clean slate, new question. So inverse sine of one half is asking us to find an angle such that sine of that angle is one half. But specifically, that angle has to be in this part of the unit circle, right? Because that's how inverse sine works. Inverse sine, you have to give an answer that's between um, negative pi over two and pi over two. So the angle that's gonna work in this case is going to be pi over six, right? If you go to an angle of pi over six, you have an x coordinate of root three over two, we don't really care about that for this, um, and a y coordinate of one half. And so inverse sine of one half is gonna equal pi over six. And so that is our final answer. So we kind of started by, by working with the inside part, but then once you do that inside part, you can forget about it. Forget about five pi over six. It's not gonna, it's not necessarily gonna be our answer. There might be some examples where you'll actually get the same angle you started with. Um, and we'll see an example where that happens in a moment, but that's not generally the case. So you can really just kind of forget about the angle that you started with once you have figured out that inside part of the function. Okay, so let's do another example. It's probably gonna be a very colorful page. Um, so let's now do inverse sine of sine of pi over three. And by the way, I encourage you in this video, you know, definitely if you feel like, okay, I think I get this, pause it and try these examples yourself and then you can just see if you got it right and, you know, um, yeah, give yourself a chance to figure it out yourself. So again, we're gonna focus on this inside part first. So we're gonna start by finding sine of pi over three. So how do we find sine of pi over three? We go to an angle of pi over three. So that's like here. This has an X coordinate of one half and a Y coordinate of root three over two. And so sine is the Y coordinate. So it is root three over two. And so now we can go back to our original question and instead of putting um, a sine of pi over three in there, we can just put root three over two because that's what we figured out that um, sine of pi over three was equal to. So now this is asking us to find an angle such that sine of that angle is root three over two and we're supposed to be looking at this part of the unit circle. So in this case, it actually is the angle that we started with, right? Because the angle that we started with was in the right part of the unit circle. 
So sometimes it does work out that you get back to the angle that you started with. Basically that happens if the angle you started with is in the correct part of the unit circle for the type of function you're looking at. So for inverse sine, that means if your original angle was between negative pi over two and positive pi over two, great. They're going, they will kind of cancel each other out in that case. But I wouldn't necessarily think about it that way. I would just kind of go through the steps and this way you're definitely, you're not gonna get it wrong if you approach it this way. Whereas if you try to kind of do this canceling idea, you might slip up and, and forget you know, what exactly is going on. Okay, so let's do another one. Um, so this one's gonna be a little bit different. So this one we're gonna do, and we'll get to some, by the way, that are not sine in a second. Um, so this one is gonna have now the inverse trig is on the inside, and the regular trig is on the outside. So we're gonna start by doing this inside part. So we're gonna start by finding inverse sine of negative one half. So let me just grab another unit circle here. So this time we're, we're starting by finding an angle, right? Like in, in these other ones, we started by taking sine and finding a number, and then at the end we found an angle. This time it's switched. This time we're starting by finding an angle, and then we're gonna find sine of that angle. So if we go to, we're, we're trying to look in this part of the unit circle, right? And we're looking for an angle where um, sine of that angle is negative one half. And so that's gonna be the place on the unit circle where we have a y coordinate of negative one half. And so that's going to be um, negative pi over six. So I mentioned this in the last video, but I just wanna say it again. It would not be correct for you to say 11 pi over six. So 11 pi over six would be if you were to measure this way. And yeah, it looks like it should be the same angle, but remember that coterminal angles are not considered to be the same angle. So when you're doing inverse sine, you need to give an answer that is between negative pi over two and positive pi over two, like literally, not just like that part of the unit circle, but like literally the angle you give needs to be between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. So phi or 11 pi over six is not between negative pi over two and positive pi over two, right? It's bigger. And so that's why we give our answer as negative pi over six instead of 11 pi over six. Okay, so now we can focus on the outside part of our function, which is taking sine of negative pi over six. So what is sine of negative pi over six? And I don't know why I meant to switch to dark green, but. So what is sine of negative pi over six? Well, we just drew that angle on the unit circle, right? And we can see that sine of that angle is negative one half. So in this case, and this actually is generally true, if the regular trig function is on the outside, then they will just kind of cancel each other out. You'll get to the, um, the original input that you had. But again, rather than trying to like just remember in which cases they cancel or not, just if you just do the inside part first and then the outside part, that will lead you to the right answer regardless of, of whether that right answer is the original input or whether it's something different. Okay, we're gonna do two more examples that are kind of along this line. Um, and then we're gonna do some examples that are a little bit different. So the, the examples we'll do, so right now we're gonna do one with cosine and we'll do one with tangent but they'll be like otherwise similar to these ones. Um, and then we'll do some examples where we actually kind of blend different trig functions. And we'll see that it's actually really, if you understand this idea of like um, doing the inside first and then the outside, you're not gonna have trouble with these other ones. They're gonna be very, very similar to how these ones work. Let me just see, what, what colors have I not used yet? Let's do, hmm, let's do orange and yellow. I hope that won't be too pale, but we'll see. Okay, so this example that we're gonna do now is going to be um, inverse cosine of cosine of negative pi over three. Okay, so we're gonna start by doing the inside part. So we're gonna start by finding cosine of negative pi over three. So how do we do that? We go on the unit circle, we sketch an angle of negative pi over three, and cosine is gonna be the x-coordinate. So 
here we have one half as our x coordinate, negative root three over two is the y coordinate. And so what is cosine of negative pi over three? It's going to be one half because it's that x coordinate. So now that we have this, we can just put one half into our inverse cosine. And we can forget that negative pi over three ever existed. Now we're just focusing on finding inverse cosine of one half. So remember that with inverse cosine, we now are gonna be looking at a different part of the unit circle than that we were looking at in the, um, the earlier questions with sine. So for inverse cosine, we're looking for angles that are between zero and pi. So we're gonna to try to find an angle between zero and pi so that cosine of that angle is one half. So the angle that will work is going to be pi over three because at an angle of pi over three, we still have an x coordinate of, um, of one half. And additionally, that angle is in the correct part of the unit circle. So it's pi over three. Okay, one more example. So we're gonna do one with tangent. And let's see, what color do I wanna use? Sorry, this is probably not interesting for you. Let's go back to this purple color. So let's do um, inverse tangent of tangent of five pi over two. So I'm gonna use, uh, maybe let's, never mind. I'm gonna use red. I don't want you to, I know I use red a lot when it's like a wrong answer, but I'm not using that here. Actually, let's just, I'll mix it up. Let's use pink. Sorry, okay. Now we got some pink on board. So let's um, focus on this inside part first. So we're gonna start by finding tangent, oh, I like this color, of five pi over two. So what, what angle is five pi over two? Well, that would be, um, so let's maybe write this out. So five pi over two is gonna be two pi plus pi over two, right? Because um, two pi would be four pi over two. So two pi is equal to four pi over two. And then we're adding on an extra pi over two. So that would be an angle of, basically it, it puts us back at pi over two. So what is tangent of five pi over two? Well, what's the slope of a, a vertical line? It doesn't exist, it's undefined. So tangent of five pi over two actually does not exist. And another way of seeing that if you don't like this slope idea is if you write down the, the coordinates zero and one, well, tangent is supposed to be the y coordinate divided by the x coordinate. And in this case, that would be one over zero, which is undefined. And so if we get something that's undefined in the inside, basically this whole thing is undefined. So this tells us that the whole thing does not exist because we kind of ran into an issue on the, the inside part of the function. Okay, so we're now gonna do some examples where we're gonna be combining different um, trig functions. But again, it's gonna be very similar to, um, to the ones that we did. So. Now we're gonna be um, combining different trig functions. Basically what I mean by that is like, instead of doing inverse sine of sine, we're doing, gonna do like inverse sine of cosine. So we're, we're kind of mixing and matching stuff. Um, so let's do as a first example, inverse sine of cosine of five pi over three. So if you understood how the, the examples we did on the last page worked, these are gonna work exactly the same. So we're gonna start by focusing on the inside part of the function. So in this case, we're gonna start by finding cosine of five pi over three. So what does five pi over three look like? Well. The way I would think about it, so you could either count out like, you know, here's one pi over three, two pi over three, three pi over three, 
4 pi over 3, 5 pi over, or no, that's wrong, 5 pi over 3. Um, personally, the way that I would think about it, though, is it's, so 6 pi over 3 would be equal to 2 pi, right? So it's not quite 6 pi over 3, it's not quite 2 pi, it's exactly pi over 3 away from 2 pi. And so I would think about it as, yeah, being like 60 degrees away from, from horizontal. And so, yeah, it's here. Oops, that I had it better before and now I have to redo it. Okay, so our x coordinate in this case is one half and our y coordinate is um, negative root three over two. So we're supposed to find cosine of this angle. And so cosine is always equal to the x coordinate. So that's one half. And so now we just go back to our original question. We forget about this cosine. We forget about everything except for the number one half. All we need is this number one half. So now this becomes a completely different question. We're, we're looking now for an angle. Um, and because it's inverse sine, we want to be on this part of the unit circle. But we're looking for an angle not so that cosine is one half, but so that sine is one half. So that means that we want the y coordinate to be one half. So that happens when we're at an angle of pi over six, which is a little bit less small than I drew, probably like this. So when you're at an angle of pi over six, well, now your y coordinate is one half, and that's what we were looking for, right? We were looking for the y coordinate to be one half. So inverse sine of one half is equal to pi over six. So notice that it's like a completely different angle than what we started with. So I don't want you to think of, of you know, and there are formulas out there, by the way, that, that exist that kind of help you go from one to the other, but I would just really discourage you from thinking about it that way. I would just you do the inside part, do the outside part, and that will get you to your answer. Okay, so let's do one now where um, it's gonna be kind of flipped. So now we're gonna have the, the outside function is gonna be a regular trig function and the inside function will be inverse trig. But we'll see it still kind of works the same um, as the other ones did. So let's say that we're doing now um, cosine of inverse sine of one. So let's start on the inside. So we're gonna start by finding inverse sine of one. So how do you find inverse sine of one? Well, you look at the part of the unit circle from negative pi over two to pi over two, and we're looking for um, a point on the unit circle or an angle on the unit circle that gives us a y coordinate of one. And so that angle is gonna be pi over two because that is the angle that has coordinates of um, zero, one. So the y coordinate is one. So inverse sine of, um, of one is equal to pi over two. And so now what do we do? Well, now we're just taking cosine of pi over two. And what is cosine of pi over two? Well, cosine of pi over two is the, um, the x coordinate of the angle of pi over two. And so that's gonna be equal to zero. Okay, let's do one more like this. And then the, the last couple that we'll do are just gonna be a little different in that they're not gonna deal with um, so much like familiar angles on the unit circle, but we'll see that we can still figure them out basically. Okay, so next one, let's do um, tangent of inverse sine of one half. And again, I know I already said this, but I encourage you at this point, you know, we've done a lot of these, pause it and try it yourself. And then you can kind of fast forward through the video and see if you get the same answer. And if not, you can go back and, and watch how to do it. So first thing we want to do is find inverse sine of one half. So inverse sine of one half, and we might have already done that one at some point. Um, inverse sine of one half means we're looking for a place on the unit or on between negative pi over two and pi over two so that the y coordinate is one half. So that's gonna happen at an angle of pi over six. So inverse sine of one half is gonna be equal to pi over six. And so now what we're doing is we're taking tangent of pi over six. So what is tangent of pi over six gonna be? Well, it's gonna be the, um, the y coordinate over the x coordinate. So it's gonna be 
1 half over root 3 over 2. And so that simplifies to 1 over square root of 3. And if you rationalize the denominator, let me, let me write this a little differently, rationalize the denominator, so we multiply by root 3 over root 3, you're going to get an answer of root 3 over 3. Okay, so last couple of examples are going to be, like I said, a little bit different. Um, so let's start with one of them here. So let's start with, um, we're going to find sine of inverse cosine of three-fifths. So by the way, this is something you probably could enter into your calculator but I would want to be able to see you actually work this out by hand. So, and this goes for a lot of stuff, like on quizzes and exams, there's gonna be stuff that I know you could just type into a calculator and get an answer. Um, so to get full credit on questions, I'm gonna be having specific expectations of really seeing how you're getting your answer by hand, if I ask you to do something by hand. So in this case, we're gonna start by focusing on the inside part, but we're not gonna actually evaluate inverse cosine of three-fifths. We're gonna to try to figure out like, what would that point look like on the unit circle? So this would be an angle theta, right? If you're doing inverse cosine, that is that gives you an angle theta. So it should be theta is an angle that's gonna be between zero and pi, so I'm just writing that in interval notation, um, such that the x-coordinate, right, because we're talking about um, cosine, so the x-coordinate on the unit circle, or maybe I should say the x-coordinate of the terminal point is three-fifths. Right, like we're, you know, I think we get really used to working with examples where it's like all these same familiar angles, but there are plenty of other points on the unit circle. So we can totally go to a point on the unit circle where the x coordinate is three fifths. So we're looking for an angle between zero and pi, and let's just go to some, we can just kind of estimate. We don't really need to draw it perfectly, it's just kind of like a, a reference. So three fifths is a little bit more than a half, so maybe it would be like around here for the x coordinate right, because this is zero, this is one, so three-fifths is gonna be somewhere between zero and one, a little bit closer to one. So I'm just gonna kind of make up a point here and say that this is our angle theta. Okay, so, so far, what do we know? We know that the, um, the x-coordinate is three-fifths, and we don't know what the y-coordinate is. So that's gonna be, like, the essential part, right, because our goal is gonna to be to find sine of this angle, and so sine of this angle is gonna be the y-coordinate, so we need to find the y-coordinate. So sine of theta, and again, we're not actually finding what theta is, and you don't need to in order to answer this. So sine of theta is the y-coordinate of the same terminal point. So how do we find that y-coordinate? Well, we just use the unit circle equation, right? So we know that um, our x-coordinate is 3 fifths, and we know that if you're on the unit circle, you should always have x squared plus y squared is equal to one. So what do we get here? We get nine over 25, plus y squared is equal to, and let's rewrite one as 25 over 25 so that we can um, have a common denominator. And so we end up with y squared is equal to 25 over 25 minus nine over 25. And that tells us that y squared is equal to 16 over 25. And so now we can take the square root of both sides and we end up with y is equal to plus or minus four over five. 
So how do we know which one it is, whether it's plus or minus? Well, if we th go back to, to the whole kind of premise of this question, we started with doing um, inverse cosine. And so inverse cosine gave us an angle that was in this part of the unit circle. Like we knew for sure when we started, like just to kind of show you what, what wasn't our answer, and now I don't have my red pen anymore, but that's okay, I'll use orange. Um, so this would be a different point that also has an x coordinate of three fifths, right? But that's not the point that we, or the angle that we're working with because um, our angle was supposed to be, like our angle came from doing inverse cosine. And so angles that come from inverse cosine must be in this part of the unit circle. So what does this tell us? This tells us that we want the positive. So it's positive because, um, basically because we know theta is in the interval from zero to pi. So that gives us our final answer, which is that y is equal to four fifths. And y tells us our, like now we know that the y coordinate is four fifths. And so let's go back to what we're actually trying to do here. We're trying to find sine of theta. And maybe to, let me just color code this, right? So theta is the angle that we drew in the first step. And we use the information that we knew about the x coordinate to kind of sketch a picture. The final, you know, what the question is actually asking us to do is to find sine of that angle. So how do we find sine of that angle? We look at the y coordinate of the terminal point. And what is the y coordinate of the terminal point? Well, we just found it. It is four fifths. And so that tells us that sine of theta, where theta is that kind of mystery angle that we drew, is equal to four fifths. All right, so I'm gonna stop it here. Um, I know, I think this is probably the hardest of all the different types that we've done. So we'll do another example that's similar to this in tomorrow's video, um, once you've had a little time to digest this, this example. Um, and then tomorrow's video, we'll also look at using inverse trig in right triangles. So um, that will actually, I think, also be a little bit easier than the type of stuff that we were doing in this video. All right, thank you, and I will see you